Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. So we're right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the last of the seven feasts. It's a great feast, which is a time of great joy and blessing where everyone should go up to Jerusalem and singing and dancing. And for use of being in Jerusalem, it's hard to believe that over a year ago we were there hopefully singing and dancing, enjoying uh, Jerusalem at that period of time. So it comes, it's the autumn feast, and we all believe that the autumn feast is actually foreshadowing the second coming of Christ, and that's yet to be fulfilled. The spring feast foreshadowed his, sec, his first coming, which we've seen. Jesus fulfilled the, the, the spring feast to the letter, to the date, completely. And then we are waiting for the autumn feast, which is talking about his second return. Do you know what? Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's the only thing I think that keeps us going. Amen. And so we see again there that people keep saying to me, oh, Arthur, this is just Jewish feasts and a Jewish calendar. Says, no, it's not. It's a biblical feast and it's a biblical calendar that God has put here in his word for us. And they say the eighth day, which will go down in history, which we happen to be in Jerusalem that day, is Shemaya Azaretz, if I pronounced that properly. That will go down in history because that was the 7th of October last year when all hell broke loose um, that's plunged the world in the Middle East into these, these terrible wars. And, um, and it's only God that can actually bring peace into this situation just now. It seems to be going just getting wider and wider. And who knows how that could open up there. So we can see that himself. In John 7, we could go to John's Gospel. And um, we'll start in the John 7. Do you know, it's, 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 it's amazing that sometimes I always wonder, it'd be great to be walking with the Lord Jesus Christ as if everything would have been wonderful. And yet even Jesus' his own brothers did not believe in him. Isn't that amazing? Well, if you actually grew up with him, I think we have to sometimes put ourselves in their shoes. I mean, they grew up with him, hallelujah. And they, they lived with him and they've seen him growing up and doing all the normal things. And Jesus was a carpenter. And I um, mean, he was very normal. He was, he, was, he was a real man, amen. He didn't walk around with a halo on his head and, he, and, and didn't have to eat or anything, didn't have to sleep. He was just, you know, constant. He was a real man. He, if he hit his finger with a, with a hammer, then it would have been sore, he would have felt pain, he, he, he had real emotions. The Bible says he was tempted in all things, and yet he was without sin. Isn't that amazing? Because Hebrews tells us we've got a high priest in the heavenlies who knows how we feel. Do you ever get, oh God, how can you know how I feel? And he says, I do know how you feel. I sent my son. I clothed myself with flesh, and I gave myself the nature that you have. I took upon myself. Your nature became my nature. Isn't that amazing? Glory to God. So he does understand us. And that psalm that I read to begin with this morning, he knows we are but dust, but he cares for us. He knows us inside and out. And that's scary, isn't it? Because sometimes we think nobody knows what's happening in the inside, what's going on in this little brain of mine. And that scary thing is that God does. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, it's like, God, please cleanse my mind. I don't know about your mind, but my mind can run away with me sometimes, and you know, and you just find all strange thoughts would come. You have to just grab them quickly and say, get ye behind me, you know, and um, so glory to God. We thank God that there's a God who understands us and goes before us, and we can see here his brothers, you know, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and it was in chapter 7, and his brothers, you know, who didn't understand him, and he says, you know, why ain't you going up to Jerusalem? You know, you're, you want to be a public figure, you better go. That's the place to be a public figure. Go there to Jerusalem. And Jesus says, my time's not ready. Any time's good for you, but not for me. And his brothers went ahead of him. And, uh, and it says, Jesus stayed behind. And, um, but it says a little bit later on, but in verse 10, we'll break in. It says, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. We'd probably say undercover. Amen. And then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was complaining among the people concerning them. Some said he's good, others said no, he's not. He's contrary, he deceives people. However, no one spoke openly about him for fear of the Jews. You know, there's always somebody controlling a narrative. We see people controlling the narrative just now. Do you know it's getting worse in our country now? You need to be careful what you, what you say, what you don't say. Because somebody's watching us and you could get into trouble if you say the wrong thing. Or, and now we're even hearing, thinking the wrong thing. We see people now are actually getting penalized. Well, they're in a zone where they know they shouldn't be, so they're putting two to two together. Someone's praying outside an abortion clinic, and, um, and so they're you know, saying that he's no right to be standing there at all, so we need to, he needs to vacate that space and protect that space. But the thing that really caught my attention here was, you know, Jesus was moving about the crowd, but nobody knew who he was. He was just mingling with the people, and he'd be listening to this and listening to the next thing and hearing everything that was getting said, and yet nobody knew he was there. 
you know, it's, it's a little picture of what's probably taking place today. You know, Jesus is still moving amongst the people of, this, of, of the world. And yet the world doesn't know he's there. But he is there. He's moving amongst us and probably testing us and watching us and listening to us and hearing what we're saying, you know, and where we're, where we're at and where we're not at. The, the invisible Christ, yes, he's in heaven, but he's here also by his spirit. He indwells all of us, those who are believers in the Lord. But he's still moving to and fro upon this world. He hasn't created the world and it's all a devil, a devil. It's the Lord, is the Lord of glory. And he's moving amongst us. He's moving across the world and he's, he's watching the world. I love that little scripture. Well, it's not really the greatest scripture. It's a very sad scripture in the book of Genesis. And I think it's Genesis 6. And it says, the Lord looked down from heaven and he's seen the wickedness of man and it broke his heart. It says his wickedness had reached a peak now which was beyond the, the, the normal. And it says he broke his heart and it says he, he made a decision that he was going to destroy the world. But it was God looked down at mankind who he created in his own image. And they're so turned far away from God that they become so terribly corrupt. It broke the heart of God. Amen. I don't think we'll ever plunge the depths of that and how important that man is in, far as in the sight of God is. For we were created in his image. Glory to God. We were the image bearers of the living God. And Satan knows that, knows that as well. And he wants to spoil it. He wants to scar it. He wants to mucky the waters. Amen. He wants to turn us into something that is abhorrent to the living God. And if you look around the world today as it was in the book of Genesis, what must God think today if he looks down and looks at the state of the nation? Let's him just focus upon our own land. Hallelujah. And the things now that are passing as normal now. Do you think it's not breaking the heart of God? Is that to look and tolerate of all this? But the Bible says this, but he is patient, not wanting anyone to be condemned, that everybody could come to salvation. God's long suffering, my friend, is an absolute blessing in disguise for us. Sometimes I say, oh, just come, Lord Jesus, just come and finish it all. Well, thank God somebody didn't pray that before I was, when I was in my teens, and because I, I wouldn't be here, I'd be lost. Hallelujah, because his grace kept it going for enough for me. And there's going to come a point as people as well that we have to see them turning in there. So we can feel the heart of Jesus moving amongst the crowds. And in verse 14 it says, Not until halfway through the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. And the, news, the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters and having never studied? Jesus brought out the deep things of this word. So much so that they were astounded because they were the ones that possessed that kind of hidden knowledge. They were able to interpret the scriptures and bring out the real depth of what they meant. And they went, how did Jesus get this? How, how is he able to preach in such a way? We've never heard, I love it, it says, we've never heard anyone speak like this man spoke. Hallelujah. And guess what? He still speaks today. For those who have ears to hear and eyes to see and um, I haven't been up my hill for a little bit just because of just the way I'm feeling, you know. It's taken me all my time to get my bed, never mind up a hill. And, um, but, it, you know, it says, I like to say, Lord, open up my eyes to see that which is unseen and open up my ears to hear your still small voice because God is constantly speaking. Hallelujah. We just need to tune our ears. Tune our ears to hear the voice of the living God. Glory to God. What a special place that we have that God is interested in speaking to us. Glory Glory to God. As I says, we can see here that, that Jesus was veiled to them. The people couldn't see who he was, even though he was in the midst of them, even though he spoke. I mean, who is this man? Who is he? Do you know, it's just like that today amongst the Jews. It says, Paul says, the veil still covers them. That You talk about Jesus when you're in Israel. So it's still a very small percentage of Jews have believed in Jesus. Very, very few. Because they, they, they were sold a lie that he was an imposter, you know, and the disciples stole his bodies and he's a liar and a deceiver. Even to this day, they hate him with a passion. Well, you have to be, see, if you were brought up that age being told that this man, who, who, this man is an imposter claiming to be God and claim to be the Messiah, you would probably, have, you know, you could see how you could probably quite hate the idea of that and you could actually be very angry with him. But God's going to have his day with his people. And so we can see these things here taking place in the veil there. And it says that, and in, 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 as, as we see here, Jesus began to teach and began to speak. Hallelujah. In verse 37, it says, On the last day, in the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For he who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And this was he was speaking more concerning the Holy Spirit, who would be poured out 
after he had fulfilled his crucifixion and rose from glory, rose from the grave and went to the Father. Jesus, the loving waters that Jesus was referring to would have been the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But on that day, they say, in the last great day, a priest would have drawn water from the pool of Siloam with a golden pitcher and then he would have carried it back to the temple and poured the silver bowl next to the altar accompanied by musicians and choirs. It was a very joyous occasion. As the priest poured out the water, he would say a prayer to the Lord to send rain Hallelujah upon the nation. Hallelujah, rain. Well, we don't have to be praying for too much rain here in the land of Scotland, do we? We was praying. We should be actually going up and praying for sunshine. And um, and I need to be increasing my prayers for that. This weather gets to me at times. But we can see here, Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, amen. Do you know what? There has to be a thirst that you have to get thirsty for the Lord. You're thirsty for him. You're, you're, there's a desire. I need to find God. And I went through a period of that myself a way back when I was getting thirsty, not thirsty for the wrong spirits because I did a lot of drinking my day and I did a lot of other things that I'm not proud of. I was caught up in a lot of kind of just chasing all the wrong things and you were thirsty for all the wrong things. You knew were bad for you, but they've got a way of demanding and you, you get caught up with them, don't you? You know this isn't good, this lifestyle, but it just seems to drive you all the wrong passions. But then there was this part where God started to get a hold of me and I get thirsty for the Lord and I started going to meetings and I was, I was looking for God and, you know, and crying out to him. Hallelujah. More importantly, he was looking for me. Glory to God. So Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, then he says, you know, that he will give us what? The living waters. Glory to God. We know that Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman very early on in John's Gospel, chapter 4. Remember the Samaritan woman, she came to the well and Jesus says, you know, give me a drink. And she says, why would you ask me for a drink sort of thing? Jesus says, if you knew it was talking to you, you'd ask me and I would give you living waters. Hallelujah. I would give you living waters. And she says, sir, give me these waters. He says, he who drinks this water will never thirst again. I tell you this, when you get God in your life, I want to tell you, it will complete you. Amen. You don't run after the wrong things anymore. They just, they just flow away from you. And all of a sudden now, there's a new life flowing within me, and it's the life of God. Hallelujah. I always thought, I, you know, I, I could never really chuck the fags or chuck this or chuck that. I don't want to say too many chucks, but there's a lot of chucks in there as well, threatening to chuck this and chuck the next thing. But see, when Jesus comes in in the fullness and God touches you by his Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, all these things that I was wrestling with, I need to stop doing that and stop doing that, it just flowed away from me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It was it because, why? Because it was a new life flowed within me and it brought joy and brought completion. Everything that I was looking for was just peace and happiness in my life and within myself. Glory to God. And only God can bring that to you if you will embrace him and ask him if you thirst. He says, ask of me and I will give you living waters. Amen. Glory to God. Thank the Lord that he's still pouring out living waters today. And the stained glass windows behind us is actually Hebrews 4, um, 12. And it talks about the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, penetrating soul, bone marrow, soul, spirit, judging the very thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And one side you'll see fire, another side you'll see water. And basically then the sword is the word of God. And water and fire on the other side is the Spirit. So you can't have one without the other. You need the Word and you need the Holy Spirit. You, you need both. Amen. Glory to God. Just thought I'd bring that to your attention. Hallelujah. And so we can see here it is, it, it's a season in, in Israel where they'll, they'll stay in booths or shelters. And, um, and they, they camp outdoors. When we were blessed just over a year ago, we were camping in a place called Peace Forest in a tent. Hallelujah. I was in my element. Hallelujah. There I was. And staying in Jerusalem in a tent, camping amongst all these Israelis. Although there were, I'll tell you this, there was a few children and, and, you know, camping with us as well, screaming the place down. I went, what on earth am I doing here? Anyway, but it was still good just being in the midst of anything but Peace Forest, staying there camping at, in, in the Feast of Tabernacles. I was in my element and um, I was just loving it even with a few rains screaming all night at times. But hallelujah, glory to God. So they're camping out and it's, and it's of course, you know, that tabernacling with the Lord is the, it's, it's, it's a wee bit looking back. Hallelujah. But John 1, 4, John 1, 14 says this, and the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. You know, one, your version will probably say who dwelt amongst us. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. John is such a, a, an understanding 
of, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, more than other disciples. John is good. I love the gospel of John. I said that to my friend, and he struggles to do it, but the gospel of John is phenomenal. It's rich. Started reading it again as well. It's just amazing. It's an amazing gospel and his understanding of where he was with the Lord. And then he, when he says that, it says, and the word became flesh and tabernacles amongst us, where the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and tabernacled amongst us. You know, some people believe, and I'm one of the ones who happen to believe that as well, that I believe Jesus was born at this season, at the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, nobody really knows when he was born, although he, we did get the reputation of Christmas and the 25th of December. But actually, the Bible never tells us completely. But really, if you probably had to have a guess, then the Feast of Tabernacles would have been the time that Jesus would have been born because he came to what? Tabernacle amongst us. He was born into this world and he came into this world to tabernacle with us, to dwell with us, to become part of us. And, um, and therefore I would say that was a very good guess if we wanted to put a date on that. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord dwelling amongst his people again like he did in the desert. God living amongst us just as he did with the Israelites in the desert when they traveled with the Lord when he brought them out of Egypt and that's when they've got to look back. I've got down here, dates and times and seasons are very important. Dates, times and seasons are very, very important to the Lord. They're very important to the Lord. That's why the Lord has given us dates, times and seasons. That's why you have the feast of the Lord. We, sometimes we can say, oh, oh, that's Jewish feast. No, listen, it's a Jewish book if you want to be pedantic about it, do you know what I mean? And it's a Jewish Messiah, I may add as well. Hallelujah. But there's so much richness within them. Glory to God. And Satan knows that as well. That's why he wants to change them or replace them. Amen. He wants to mix them up because if he can change them and move them and replace them, then we lose sight of the deepness of the Hebraic meaning. So often it gets missing to us. And we had a guy here through the week, um, Aaron uh, Aimee. And I always, the, the girl that told me to pronounce his name, she just says, just say, I, me, I, me. That easy when somebody tells you how to pronounce somebody's name. You look at initials and I'm going to embarrass myself here. And, um, but can I tell you this as well? In fact, Daniel 7, I forget what verse it is, it says Satan tries to change the times and the seasons. And, he, and you know, he's always trying to change the times and the seasons. God is very particular about times and the seasons. Hallelujah. God doesn't miss a beat. Therefore, we have to there's Christmas. So what is the feast about? The feasts are all about looking back and also it's about looking forward. And that's what, again, what we see here in the Feast of Tabernacles. It's about looking back and reminding themselves of where they came from, but it's also looking forward to see where they're going. Amen. And it's always a good picture to find ourselves in, and I want to bring that to us even this morning. Sometimes it's always good to look back and remind yourself where you came from before you get too big for your boots. I remember where I came from, and I wasn't doing too well. Amen. You know, I mean, I wasn't crawling about in a gutter, but I want to tell you this. Well, maybe sometimes I was, to be truthful. But what I just want to know is I remember where I came from, and I know where I am, but the most important thing is I know where I'm going. Amen. So no, it's not just about where you came from, but really it's where you go. It's where you're going. And this is the thing about the Jewish people. It makes them, they, they're always looking back, right back to their very roots and where they started. Father Abraham, I'll go back to Adam, but they'll go back to Abraham and they're reminded of the journey, the journey through time that God has taken to them, brought them into Egypt, then brought them out of Egypt and then their wanderings for 40 years in the wilderness. And that's when they remember this Feast of Tabernacles, remember their people for 40 years, they lived in tents or booths in a desert area where God took care of their every single need. Their whole need was completely and utterly taken forward. You know, the Bible says their shoes didn't wear out. I wish I had a pair of shoes like that. 40 years in the wilderness, walking across rocks and things like that. And it says their shoes did not wear out. And he fed them with bread every single day. And yes, they had a wee bit of thirst going on now and again. But every now and again, God opened up the rocks and all of a sudden a big river just appeared. He took care of them in a God-forsaken wilderness. And I've been in that kind of wilderness zone. You always think it's sand. It's not. It's rocky and it's wilderness. It's bleak. And then, um, but the Lord sustained them. And every day, and it's amazing how God says, you know, I'll give you bread every day. Give me my daily bread. And it wasn't enough. Like keep gathering enough bread. So I've got a wee storehouse just in case for a week. And it says, if you try to keep it for the second day, it went, it, it went off really fast. So every single day they were dependent upon God for their daily bread. God made them dependent upon him. Hallelujah. It's a great place to be dependent upon God. 
Sometimes, you know, when things are going too good for us, you know, and everything's nice, we've got, we're running about with plastic cards, you know, tap it. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 you don't feel as if you're spending money, you just go, uh, tap. <laughs> tap. <laughs> you know, you might look at this. They make it so easy, isn't it? But, you know, I, you know, I, I remember the days when, the, when, I'm, I'm, when I'm, I'm going down the side of a couch to find some money because I'm skint and I've got nothing. And I'm oh, God, please, God. I didn't like those days, but you know something? They were special days because it made me dependent upon God every single day. You know, I ran a wee business once and I was always struggling for periods of time. And, um, and I used to always moan God. I said, God, I'm, look, I'm doing my best. I'm tithing. And, you know, and you're always just looking for a break. And when's the break going to come? And, you know, and, but do you know something that I always said? People used to say to me back then in the church, there was a kind of wee, there was a wee lull came into the church and people said, oh, I'm a wee bit backslidden today. I'm a wee bit. And it just basically meant they took their foot off the accelerator. Do you know what I mean? Take their foot off the pedal a wee bit and just oh, come on. And they just seen them kind of, they just weren't kind of on the pulse. You ever get that? You're just no, you're not just no, you've not got your finger on the pulse. And I remember I used to say, I mean, I can't afford to be lukewarm and back, a wee bit backslidden. I needed that phone to ring. I needed things to, and, you know, I was just so dependent upon God. It was like, you know, and you know, when I look back on them, they were, they were difficult days, but thank God for them. Do you know why? Because it made me trust God. Rather than because, you know, you get too much, you can just think, oh, well, I don't really need God for today or next week. Isn't that interesting when the Lord says, when I'm bringing you into the promised land, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to bless you abundantly. He says, you're going, to have a, you're going to have everything you need. He says, but I want you to tell you this, when the day, that day comes, you'll forget about me. You'll become fat and, and you'll become you know, self-sufficient. And you will then begin to forget about me. You know, that's the danger. Thank God for resources. And it's how you handle the resources. Even when God blesses you. And listen, God will bless people. In fact, God will raise up millionaires. I mean, God has not a problem with us having money. The big problem is when money's got me. And, and all of a sudden, then, you know, it runs away with me. And all of a sudden, now I'm running away after it. And just getting caught up in all the wrong things. Hallelujah. God will always make provision for us. And so when they're thinking back... And we're going to have a little look back now. We'll go to the book of Exodus. <clears throat> I don't know about you. I was, I was, I, I was feeling like a bus couch. See, every time I was doing this wee study, I started to feel better. <laughs> so hopefully you're going to feel better as well if you're feeling like a half-shut knife or a bus couch and um, that you might be feeling a little bit better at the end of this. And Exodus 25, and we'll read the first nine verses. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they will bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with their heart, you shall take my offering. And this is offering which you'll take from them, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, oint stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern and all of its furnishings just so that you shall make it. Hallelujah. Well, all of these goods that they were to bring were all for the construction of the tabernacle because God was going to say, because God says, I want to live amongst them. Isn't that amazing? That God says, I want to live in the midst of my people. Glory to God. And they were going to build for him a tabernacle so God could dwell in their midst. And this was in the wilderness when they were traveling through the wilderness. Glory to God. Amazing. Let me just read another little verse here. So I'll go up to verse, um, chapter 29. And we'll read another couple of verses here. In verse 43 it says this. And there I will meet with the children of Israel. And my tabernacle shall be sanctified by the, my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. That I may dwell among them for I am the Lord their God. God wanted to come in tabernacle. God wanted to come and set up camp in the midst of his people. Just one little verse up here. And um, well, I'll read it here. I've got it down here. Leviticus 26 as well. It says this. And 11, it says, I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. 
Isn't that amazing, isn't it? That God's, God ultimately wanted to come and dwell with us. Even here in the picture in the Old Testament, among the people of Israel that he set apart to be a bright light to the nations, it says, but God says, I want to come and camp out with you. Hallelujah. I want to come and be in your midst. But he had to prepare them first. They had to prepare a sanctuary. He was busy preparing them, brought them out into the Mount Sinai where they entered into a covenant, a covenant relationship with the covenant God. And God set the rules out. The Ten Commandments went forth, the voice of God in Mount Sinai. Hallelujah. And, and it says, you know, and, they, and, and, and God gave them his laws and he says, we will obey your laws. He says, and, and, and you will be our God. And God says, and I, will be, I will be your God and you will be my people. They entered into a marriage. It was a marriage relationship. They were married to God and they became the people of God. Amen. And then we see the sanctuary was getting built now and God was going, I'm going to come and I'm going to make my home in your midst. What a privileged place Israel would have. There's a wonderful picture. And um, I would have tried to put it up on the screen there, but my tea wasn't there. And it's, a, and, it's, and it's all the tents. You see, when God set up the tabernacle, the tabernacle was right in the middle of the camp of Israel. The 12 tribes were all surrounding it. So it's hundreds and thousands of tents all the way around in a big massive circle. But God's tent, if you like, the tabernacle was surrounded by this tent, right in the midst of it. Hallelujah. And the presence of God was right in the midst of his people. So they were all camped all round about this and the presence of God was right in the middle of the people. It's not amazing that God would be right in the midst of his people because guess what? That's where God wanted to be, right in the midst of his people. Hallelujah. In the midst of us. He wanted to be part of us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I just love that picture. And that's a picture. And we know that the people drove the Lord um, to despair many, many times. And we know that that happy situation in the, in, in the desert it was not good for many of them because there were a bunch of moaners. There were a bunch of complainers. They were moaning about this. They were moaning about the next thing. Everything was bad. Everything was, oh, damn. why did we ever leave Egypt in the first place? And it's amazing sometimes when you look back and you become a Christian and, you know, we, it's easy to say, how could the Israelites moan? The very presence of God was there. There was a, a pillar of cloud in the sky at night, a, a, a fire at night, and there was a pillar of cloud during the day. The presence of God was visible. They could see it. And guess what? They moaned and they complained. It's a wee bit like maybe you think of us now as well, isn't it? You know, we, you ever go through these spells, you're just moaning, oh, for goodness sakes. And you, know, and you look back at your life and think, I was actually okay before I became a Christian. My life wasn't that bad. And then you start looking at all the wee happy times. Nothing happy about them, but you can fool yourself. I was, that was a good night and that was a good time. And, that, you know, and look at me now, I'm sitting here, I'm miserable and moo. We can easily lose our joy and we can lose the plot sometimes. And we suffer just as much as they suffer because living in the flesh is not easy. This is why we have to love, live beyond that and we have to see the Lord and we bring the Lord into the midst of our flesh to help us to live our life. But what I'm trying to get to you here is God wants to come close to us. Now, I, I think we have to have a better understanding who this God is. You know, we, this, this, is, this is the God who created the heavens and created the earth. This, this is God who created all things. His holiness is so glorious. If, if he actually revealed himself to us, we could all fall down dead just now because he's, he's so great and glorious. We, we just couldn't handle his presence. We just all collapse in his presence. And yet this is the very God who wants to come and he wants to be close to us. And he wants to dwell with us. I don't know about you, but I find that exciting. So let's just go back to Genesis and we're going to be pushing through here to a closure. In the very beginning, isn't it? So when you want to get a, bit, a, a picture of how God planned it all to be was we go to the book of Genesis. We'll break in at two. And we'll break in yeah, chapter two and verse seven. And it says, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. That's the things that separated us from the rest of God's creation. God created all things, the trees, the bugs, the microscopic life that you can't see. Everything was created. But when he made man, he made man in his image and he breathed life into us so that we became a living being. Hallelujah. We were, we were totally different from the rest of creation. We were created in the image of God and the breath of God was breathed into our first father, Adam. And it says this, the Lord planted a garden in the east of Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree was life for all those in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge and good and evil was there as well. Hallelujah. And um, rather than reading all of it, we'll just read a couple of other verses here. 15. 
And um, 15 says, this, Then the Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you are free to eat, but the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God made it, it said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each creature, that was its name. So God, so Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds in the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall in man. And Adam, and he slept, and he took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh with its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought it to, her, to, to the man. And he says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and it shall become one flesh. They were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. There was just absolute purity. Just like little children, you know, and little children, they can run about, start naked, and they're not, they're not got a care in the world. No, they're just so innocent, aren't they? They just not got a consciousness. And if you like to take that back, when man was first formed, and they were so pure, or even though in their nakedness, there was just no, there was no, there was no any compensity to evil. They were pure, absolutely pure, in the presence of God, and there was no shame. They were made wonderfully. Now you can imagine that scene back then. We don't know how, how long Adam and Eve lived before the fall. But Adam had a wonderful relationship with God. He brought him to all the animals and he named all the animals. And there was quite a lot of animals. And so he had, a, he, had a, he had a relationship with God where God came daily and he had connection with God because God wanted to create him in his image for fellowship. Hallelujah. We were made for fellowship that God wanted to commune with us. Hallelujah. Do you know, women, that's, a, that's, that's one of these questions. Maybe somebody will ask you that. So everybody thinks we're all made from the dust of the earth. But women, you were not made from the dirt. Amen. Men were made from the dirt. We were made from the dust. But you are special, ladies. Because God made you out of one of man's ribs. So we came from the dust, and you came from a rib. Hallelujah. So glory to God. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'll leave that with you to make up your mind in that. But that's interesting, isn't it? That didn't, because he made all the animals. All the animals were all made out of dust, from the dust of the earth. And, you know, but it says, but for women, he chose to put the man asleep and took one of his ribs. And I think there's the symbolism of that, that a woman was meant to be at the side of man, so she's the rib being at the side, isn't it? And she is part of man, amen, they are one. God brought them together and they become one, so they become knitted together. It's a wonderful picture, and I'm sure there's so much more we could get into, but we won't there just now. We'll just jump up here and we'll read one and three and eight, and it says this. Once they'd eaten of the tree and they'd fallen, it says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Why? Because all of a sudden now they disobeyed the commandment of God. Sin came in and all of a sudden now when the presence of God came, we hid from the presence of God. Can I tell you this? Sin will always separate you from the presence of God. Always. You know, whenever, whenever you take your foot off the accelerator, you get caught in things, you know you shouldn't get caught on. I want to tell you this, you won't feel that close to God. Amen. All of a sudden now it's like, I don't feel the presence of God. And sometimes when you don't feel the presence of God, it's always good to have a healthy checkup. Amen. And just say, I need to check myself up here and just have a look at myself. Is there something going on in my life? Am I missing something? When you don't feel that presence of God. Sometimes you just, you just have to, sometimes it's like that. There are seasons where you don't feel God. That doesn't mean you say God's not there. It just means sometimes you'll hit those seasons. Sometimes you're on the mountaintop. Sometimes you find yourself in the valley. And it just comes with the turf. But can you see that wonderful relationship now was broken? That they had a great relationship with the Lord. Hallelujah. The intimacy that God had with his man and his woman. Do you know, that's what God wants for us. God wants to have a living relationship with an intimate relationship. I don't know about you. Do you ever feel like I'm, I'm not worthy? <laughs> you know, and I don't, and you know, no matter how good you feel, but in the light of God, you think, oh, I, I just, I'm not worthy to have that relationship with God. We, we read about the, you know, you know, Jacob's and Abraham's and Moses and, you know, and David's and all these, you know, but sometimes deep within yourself, you say, Lord, I just don't feel worthy to have that relationship. Do you know something? We have to see it from God's perspective. You are worthy because you were created in his image. And, and he loves you. See, the trouble is we have to try and, you know, we, we have to try and, and I think that's why, I remember someone once preached a sermon and says, you need to, you know, you, you need to love yourself. I've always seen that as negative. Oh, Lord, to love yourself means to be, you know, 
as if, you know, oh, I'm in love with myself, mirror, mirror on the wall, and, you know, you stand there and you stare at yourself and you think, oh, how good do I look? It's not about that. Loving yourself is actually just, just having, you know, to be able to love yourself. It says, men, love your wife as you love yourself. You know, and, and if you can't love yourself, you'll struggle to love your wife. Amen. We, need to, we have to love ourselves, and when we know we were created in the image of God, we will love ourselves, and I won't be caught up in this racket out there with the, the so-called Love Island type beauties out there, and everybody feels, oh, I feel so, I feel terrible, because I'm looking at the so-called beautiful people out there. Listen, beauty is skin deep, my friends. There's nothing very beautiful about them. I mean, deep down within them, I want to tell you this, if you, if you could get a picture of what they would probably look like in the, in the outside, it would be horrific, because inside, they're, they're so caught up in themselves. But thank God we can be caught up with God. And so what I'm trying to say here today is, you know, we have to, God wants to have a, a living relationship with us. He wants to tabernacle with us. He wants to come and he wants to dwell with us. Glory to God. He wants to have that unique relationship with us, a special relationship. And we need to open up our hearts to bring him in. Amen. To bring him in and reach out to the mighty one who reached out to us. We have an enemy who wants to split us from the Lord, who wants to destroy that relationship. And even today, he's constantly trying to break our relationship with God, trying to get in the way so that I don't see God and trying to split up. And then all of a sudden, I can get upset with things and all of a sudden, I can get taken down another road. Just as he did with Adam and Eve, Satan is very busy trying to destroy anybody's relationship with God to get in the road with you. And that can come in many shapes and forms to disturb that. But the great thing is that God is constantly reaching out to us. Glory to God. God was determined to bring us back into fellowship. Amen. God was determined to bring us back into fellowship that he might freely walk amongst us in the beauty of holiness. Do you know something? We were created for the presence of God. That's a cracking statement. We were created for the presence of God. We were created because God wanted to come and have a fellowship with us. God wants to come and dwell with us. God wants to walk with us. God wants to share our life. God wants to talk with us. God wants us to come and sit and talk with him. Hallelujah. And have a conversation with him. Isn't that amazing when you can have that relationship with God that you can just pull aside and you can just, you can sit there and unbear your heart before the living God. Even though he's invisible, he's very, very real. God has poured out his spirit upon us, brothers and sisters. And I want to kind of remind us that again, even at this particular feast, when Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him ask of me and I will give him living water. Amen. Which means is I will give him of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. A deposit. The Holy Spirit is only a deposit. A deposit of what? Guaranteeing the glorious future that awaits the children of God. Amen. Do you know there's a glorious future awaiting for us? Every single one of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a future awaiting for us. The Holy Spirit, what we have just now is nothing in comparison to what is waiting for us. Amen. We are going to be transformed. We are going to be changed. In a twinkle of an eye, hallelujah. Kiss yourself goodbye because that's it. You're gone. Amen. You're changed. In a twinkle of an eye, as I says, so kiss yourself goodbye. That's it. That's the end of the old. Welcome the new. I'll be changed and then you'll be changed and we will be caught up into the presence of God and we will be like him. Hallelujah. I will never have another wicked thought in my head and I've got lots of wicked thoughts that crash into my head. I'll never have another wicked thought. I'll be pure. I'll be completely whole. I will be like God himself. Hallelujah. The son of God. The nature of God is going to be imputed within us. New bodies, new life, new presence of the living God. Let me finish with two scriptures here this morning, which is quite amazing. We'll get them in the book of Revelation. The last book in the Bible, hallelujah. And I'm just going to read verse from chapter 21. <clears throat> a couple of verses, it says this. And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now with men, and he will dwell with them, and, he shall be, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them, and he will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 
Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said to me, I is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. It's not an amazing portion of Scripture that is awaiting for us, us who have believed in the Lord. That day is coming when the heavens are going to be opened up and a new Jerusalem is coming down to this earth and God himself will dwell in the midst of us forever and ever and ever. No more sorrow, no more pain. I mean, that sounds pretty decent to me. That sounds pretty good. Hallelujah. And we will see the Lord face to face and we will walk amongst them just as he intended the way back in the book of the Garden of Eden. God came and walked amongst us and there was no more any shame. There was no more about to hide from the Lord. Or all of a sudden there'll just be the purity. There'll be a beautiful, pure relationship. And just one more little portion of scripture here in Revelation 22, 1 to 5, it says this. And he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God of the, and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street, on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Each tree yielded its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, for the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, no need or no lamp, that they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. I don't know what that looks like, but to me, I want to tell you this, that is the great hope of the faith which we hold to to now. This life is not our home. Amen. This life is a fallen world, and God has came into this world, and he's sustaining us in the world. But we should always have look as the, as the Jewish people at this point. They look back. They remember the journey. They remember their fathers. They remember where they came from. They remember the wilderness years. And they remember that God was taking them to a promised land. And in that promised land they are just now. But they've yet to take full possession of that land. It's anything but a promised land. It's been havoc for them. Fighting and, 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 and having to fight just to take hold of the land and keep alive. I want to tell you this. But I want to tell you this, the real promised land is waiting for us on the other side. Glory to God. And that is the hope. We need to keep going back to this as, and have a look back, but more importantly, look ahead. See, when you look ahead and you see the reward for those who are serving God, amen, it will keep me pressing in. It will keep me going forward. It will stop me from going backwards or going sideways or going that way. I know where I'm going, glory to God. I know where I came from. More importantly... I know where I'm going. Heaven, hallelujah, glory to God. A new life, a completely new life. And it's one that's waiting for us forever and ever and ever. For all those who believe in the Messiah. Can I encourage all of us this time and season that God wants to dwell with you. In fact, you need to go home and look in the mirror and say, God wants to dwell with me. Talk yourself up because it's still good to talk yourself down and say, oh, I'm unworthy, unworthy. Listen, he knows us. And none of us are going to be perfect. Can I tell you that just now? None of us are. Be, but see when you know that you just how, how God sees you and how God loves you. I want to tell you this. It makes you, it just makes you feel better. Glory to God. And sometimes I think the devil's got enough time making us feel bad. He's good at making you feel bad, making you feel unworthy. And, you know, you're no good. And, you know, God doesn't want you. God will never have a relationship with you, pal. Forget it. And, you know, or if he does, you're away out there in the sticks. And he's robbing us from a very personal intimate relationship. That's what I want you to say to you this morning. And I'm, listen, I'm talking to myself here. God wants to have a very intimate relationship with me. But I'm the one. I'm the stumbling block. I'm the one that's kind of, you know. See when you see yourself as God sees us. Hallelujah. It will change everything. It will change everything as we see ourselves as God sees us. He knows us. He knows us inside out. And guess what? He chose to die for us. Amen. To reveal his son in us. Glory to God because he wants to have a relationship with us here not just in heaven here here he's given us of his holy spirit i can have a relationship with the living god that's exciting and i need to excite myself amen thanks for watching if you've been challenged today then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you and also remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message